Aloha no, I'm Leslie Wilcox of PBS Hawaii, and this is Long Story Short. You've heard the expression, nice guys finish last? Not true, not when it comes to U.S. Senator Daniel Akaka. Except at the very beginning of his political career, he's been number one in the balloting for every elective office for which he's run. Political supporters and opponents agree on one thing. He's full of aloha, not a cheap smarmy version, but real aloha. Join me in a conversation with Hawaii's junior United States Senator, next. Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox, produced with Sony Technology, is Hawaii's first weekly television program produced and broadcast in HD. High definition, it's in Sony's DNA. Daniel Kahikina Akaka is the only native Hawaiian and the only member of Chinese ancestry serving in the U.S. Senate as I speak. Since 1976, he's represented Hawaii in Washington, D.C., first in the House of Representatives and now in the Senate. Our conversation begins at his birth through a story heard from his older brother Abe, who would become the Reverend Abraham Akaka of Kawaiahao Church. Well, when I first entered the world, let me tell you about what Brother Abe said. He said that I came before dawn and that my dad uh, uh, helped to bring me into this world. Was it in your house? At home. Where's, where was home? And home was in Powell Valley. And um, they cleaned me up, according to Brother Abe, and uh, my dad called the family to the parlor, and we had what we called at that time Ohana. And Ohana was a devotion. And it was uh, an Ohana to celebrate my birth. And when the Ohana was finished, according to Brother Abe, uh, a pa named me Daniel. And he said that Daniel will someday be in the lion's den. And in a sense, that was prophetic. Because when you think of what I'm doing now as a senator, in a sense, we are in a lion's den. And that uh, Daniel will prevail as it is in the Bible. What part of what you do now puts you in the lion's den? It's, uh, it's the kind of issues that uh, are raised by, by members of, of the Senate in our case today and uh, the way in which they try to uh, have people uh, join them in, in some of the issues and the way they try to pass it on the floor. And I would tell you it's, it's done in a procedural way, but uh, the way it's done, it's tough. What's the most ferocious lion you face? Well, the, the most ferocious lions are, the, are my friends who have uh, issues that are dear to them. And the thing about me and coming from Hawaii, I would tell you and uh, I would say it would really benefit others who are also uh, in, in Congress, is that you can still be friends. So the toughest adversaries are your friends? Yes. And that doesn't sound right, but uh, we are friends and there are friends today and it occurs today with me where after we, we're done uh, with the debate and the bill is either pass or fails they would come up to me and shake my hand and uh, you know which shows that the friendship was still there and and that's a good way to to serve so there you are a few minutes old and your family's having a devotion and you're being named Daniel and uh, then what happened then I, I then took my place in a family, and I was number eight. Were you the last? And the baby, or the family, and I was the last. But with eight kids, you know, it's hard for me to imagine supporting eight children. How was your life? What was it like? It was, it was good. I would use that word. Although it was difficult because of the situation and circumstances, when I tell you that we lived in a two-bedroom home and we had a port, a lanai, uh, that we used too as an extension. So who slept where in this two-bedroom house? Well, most of the children s 
slept in, a, in one bedroom, and some in the parlor, and some in the other bedroom. And Pa and Ma slept in one, and they slept on the floor. No beds? They were beds, but we slept on the beds. And your parents let you, yes. they, they picked they the floor off? Yes. And uh, we would have ohana twice a day in the family. So early in the morning before my dad went to work. And where did he go to work? He was uh, an iron worker. He worked at Honolulu Iron Works. Was that in Kaka'ako? It was. So that was, uh, that was a hardcore place. Yeah, well, Lots of industry and tough yes. folks. Well, it lo was located right across the f present federal building where the restaurants are. And um, he worked there every day. Uh, he was a molder. What does a molder do? Um, he would uh, use sand to uh, make patterns in which they poured the steel to create whether it was a gear or whatever. Oh, I see. And most of the work were for sugar plantations. So whatever parts that they needed, they made there. And your mom, did she stay home with eight kids? She was a housewife. Uh, she was Pio Hawaiian and very, very gracious, uh, loving uh, Hawaiian woman, rotund, uh, and uh, I, I remember her as such a beautiful lady. Did she speak Hawaiian? She, oh, yes. She and my dad spoke Hawaiian. When they didn't want you to know what they were yes, talking about? Unfortunately, in, in those days when we were little, they would uh, ask us not to speak Hawaiian, to speak English, learn English as best you can, because that's the language today. Your dad was also Chinese, right? Yes, he was Chinese, and his dad came from Fukien, China and married a Hawaiian girl, and they lived in, in Pawa. And in fact, the, his name and your middle name both refer to Chinese origins? That's right, and it's, in Hawaiian, it, it's the East. Kahikina. Kahikina, yeah. What lessons did you learn from your mom and your dad, and how were they different? My mom and dad, as I said, were very spiritual people. Uh, for us and the whole family, you know, the church was so important. And uh, so Sundays, for me as I grew up, it was church day. Uh, in the morning, we'd, uh, there were times when we walked from Pawa to Kwahau Church. Um, and we'd be there for Sunday school in the morning at nine. And after that, then we went to a regular, a regular church service, which was done about noon. And then we went home and we'd have lunch at home, then we went to another church in Powell Valley at 2 p.m. Then we'd go back home and get ready for church again at Kwaihao. We would have Christian Endeavor uh, uh, classes, and uh, which started at 6, and at 7.30, the evening service began, and we'd stay there for the, that, and after the service, we went home. That was our Sunday. But even with that, there was ohana in the morning and ohana in the, in the evening for the family every day. Devoted and devout and headed for a life of service, Daniel Akaka would go on to graduate from Kamehameha Schools in 1942, having witnessed the attack on Pearl Harbor from Kapalama Heights. He served in the Army Corps of Engineers during the war and became a school teacher and a principal before entering politics. Dan Akaka followed his faith in God and in people who advised and supported him all the way to Capitol Hill. Your brother Abraham would grow up to have a very prominent position as pastor of Kawaiha'o Church. You were the choir director for 17 years. Your family was so spiritual. Did you ever have a crisis of faith? I can't remember that. I don't think so. You never said to yourself, where's God when I need him? And maybe this whole thing well, I've grown up with isn't really... Yeah. Well, when we grew up, my mother and dad really, I mean, they talked to us a lot too, you know, and they, they were sure that we understood that we could trust God. And anytime you need him, he's there. And I must tell you that it has helped me all my life, including where I am now. And when you don't get what you pray for? Well, there's a reason. 
I mean, and that's do you, ever, how they do you understand us. the reason? That's right. And uh, uh, well, we may not at that time, but later on when we look back, we say, oh, you, you, we didn't understand it at that time, but uh, things work out. I'll bet you were under some influence to become a missionary yourself. Yes, yes. And uh, later on, I came to think that, you know, there are different ways of being a missionary. You don't have to be a preacher like Brother Abe. And Brother Abe, for me, was doing so well. I thought, hey, one in a family is enough. And so I would maybe do my work uh, uh, in other ways. And this is why I went into education, as I did, uh, in order to help people. I presume you jumped on the GI Bill and attended college on that basis. Yes. Would you have gone to college otherwise? No. You know, it was a blessing for me. The GI Bill, you know, helped not only me, but it helped uh, Senator Inouye and Senator Matsunaga as well, and many others. You went on to get a master's in education as yes. well. Was that also on the GI Bill? Yes, yes. So we really benefited, but when you look at it, what we did during our time really changed the world. And in Hawaii, it changed Hawaii too, because many of them became leaders uh, in the legislature as well, and leaders of the government. And so my feeling was we got to have a GI Bill for, for our latest veterans. And so I'm so glad we were able to pass it as we did. In 2006, Time Magazine uh, ran a feature that called you one of the Hill's five worst legislators. Yeah. It said that you're living proof that having experience doesn't necessarily mean you have expertise, and it called you a master of the minor bill, minor resolution and the bill that dies in committee. You know, they were very wrong, I, really wrong, and my colleagues told me that. They said, what? You know, this is wrong. For instance, uh, one of the big bills that I, I just passed was a Filipino veterans. 62 years they haven't been able to pass it, and I passed it. I mean, that's really big, and uh, uh, there are other bills that I, that I can mention, but, but these are uh, important bills that I was able to pass, but I passed it you know, using the Hawaiian method of dealing with, with my colleagues, and they appreciate it. And I sense that you're not there because you're terribly ambitious to succeed in a certain way. You're there because you enjoy it. Well, it's not under that, but I'm there because I can help people. Because That's you, you can real be effective. Reason. And I'm not there for Dan or Kaka. I'm there for the people of Hawaii. And so whatever I do, as a matter of fact, Many, many times my staff would tell me, hey, get up front. But I don't. I, I would rather stay back a step. And As a matter of fact, if you wanted to retire, you'd be under intense pressure not to leave because of your seniority. That's, that's correct. Uh, and we were, we were able to do so much for Hawaii and for our country. And, uh, and we're doing it. So, you know, you're, how old are you now? I will be 84. So what do you see in the way of your future? How do you expect the future to play out for you? Well, I look at uh, continuing to have good health and to continue to do all I can to help the people of Hawaii uh, with my experience, with the way I work with people, and, uh, uh, and to help this country. And now with a new administration coming forth, you know, we, we need to transist into uh, a Congress that can really produce and help our country and Hawaii. Speaking of producing, there's the Akaka Bill, which has been waiting and waiting and stalled and stalled. Um, do you think it'll pass? It can pass if we can get it to the floor. Now, I'm saying it that way because this has been the problem that I've not been able to get it to the floor. It passed the House twice. It passed uh, this, this Congress. And the reason is that in the Senate, 
one senator can hold up a bill. And that's what happens. And to get it to the floor, we have to use what we call cloture. We have to invoke cloture. And to do that, we need 60 votes and not majority. And so to get the 60 votes, it's really tough. The last time I, I did that, I ended up with 56 votes and therefore couldn't get it to the floor. But if we can get it to the floor, we'll pass it. What's been dubbed the Akaka Bill is legislation to provide federal recognition of a native Hawaiian governing entity. In the U.S. Senate, Dan Akaka chairs the Congressional Task Force on Native Hawaiian Issues and the Veterans Affairs Committee. On the Hill and at home, his life is about building and keeping relationships. He and his wife of 60 years, Millie, have five children, 14 grandchildren, and seven great-grandchildren. Where does Millie enter the picture? Where did, when did she come into your life? She came into my life uh, before I went to the Pacific, uh, into the Army. You, where did you meet her? She met me. She wanted to meet you, at, is that what uh, you're saying? That's right. She, uh, I was with what we call the Hawaiian Civic, Junior Hawaiian Civic Club. And uh, I was on the board of the Civic Club. And to, to take members, we would have to interview them. Mm -hmm. So I was interviewing members, and she was one I interviewed. Now, was she doing that because she wanted to well, meet you? Well, I learned later was she wanted me to interview her, and she was sure that she came to me. And uh, that was the beginning. You know, after six decades of marriage, your wife still comes to the office every day, every yeah. day, and essentially puts in the same day you do and, and um, is so supportive of you. And you two seem like you've still got this very good thing going, very close. Yes, so she takes good care of me. As a matter of fact, I, she has that responsibility of keeping, keeping me healthy. Uh, and she comes to work every day. She's my only unpaid staff. I tell her that. <laughs> what does she and, do in the office? Well, she comes in and she, uh, usually meets with guests who come, and many of them from Hawaii, or most of them from Hawaii. And she's the type that uh, as soon as she gets in office, she takes off her shoes, and she walks around bare feet. And so some of the guests, they look down and they say, ooh, <laughs> she's bare feet. And we always, I always tell them, look, you folks are welcome to take off your shoes in my office <laughs> uh, and be comfortable. But, you know, she could easily stay home at your condo in D.C. Yeah. or go meet with friends, but she's always there. Why, why is yeah. that? Well, she loves to do that uh, because she saves people and she's able to talk to people and I guess it's better than staying home. Um, but she, she likes that style. Uh, and the other reason, although I've never said it, that she helps. Uh, we need three passengers in a car. <laughs> To get into the zipper lane or something. <laughs> <laughs> and without her, we don't have three. <laughs> <laughs> who's the other one? Uh, who's the the other third? is uh, Jim Sakai, who, who is my administrative assistant, who picks us up uh, you know, in the morning, <laughs> takes us up home at night. And, uh, so the three of us use the HOV. You, know. you spend uh, most of the year in DC, right? It's about 10 months. What do you like about living in D.C., and why, why is it so important to you to continue working long after a time when many folks would have retired? Take it easy. Well, there's so much to do there, and I, that's what I like, too. The hours are long. I keep, keep telling the young people, I said, look, you never stop learning in your life. I said, I thought I was learning a lot when I was in, in Kamehameha. I thought I was learning a lot when I was at the UH. I said, but here I'm still learning. I said, every time there's a new bill, there's something new to learn. And my health has been good. Uh, and Millie has been very supportive. So, so that helps me do my job. She's completely herself. Yeah, oh, very. Despite who she's around, oh, right? Yes, very. And, and even 
my colleagues know that. You know, she's herself, and she says what she wants to say. And there isn't a lot of pressure to kind of conform and be a certain way and be accepted in, in a certain way. You haven't yes. felt that? Well, I felt I felt that, but she's one that uh, does what she wants to do, and and you support uh, her to in, yes. in being that way, but of herself. You know, my my colleagues like that, so whenever they see me, even today, they don't say, "Danny, how are you?" They say, "Danny, how's Millie?" <laughs> Millie will say what she's thinking, won't she? Yeah, oh, very much. Has she ever told anybody off on Capitol oh, Hill? Yes, <laughs> yes, but she says it in a way where, that they accept it, mm -hmm. and. Uh, yeah, I've well, you do it. the same thing too, don't you? What's I that? Mean, don't, yeah. Aren't you able to tell people things in a way that they don't get offended, even though it's counter to what they're thinking or what they want? Yes, that's uh, what I call the Hawaiian style of, of uh, communicating. And it works. And I, I just hope that uh, more people will, would use that. And people like you for it and uh, feel that you're a good friend and they can trust you. That's the other word that's so important up there. Well, tell me, what's, give me a course in how to disagree Hawaiian style. Yes, well, one is to be sure that your, your friend, your opponent, knows what you're all about and where you are. Uh, and if you know that uh, what you're trying to do is what he doesn't want, and, and you need to find out what it's all about and uh, try to present it in a way that, uh, that, that is non-threatening. And that's a big thing. And to say it in, in a way where you know, you're not yelling or screaming, uh, and you're telling them in a nice way, or even say, you know, my friend, I disagree with you. But you first know. you say you have to understand who they are and what they that's want. That's right, that's right. Well, let me ask you this, and, and you've seen this in campaigns, you've been through it all. Um, when one is nice and kind, that's often mistaken for softness, weakness, being less than smart. Tell me your experiences yes. in running up against that. When I first went there, many people told me that. They said, hey, you can't be like that. And now that I've been there all these years, I've got to tell them they're wrong that you can be nice, uh, but you gotta be upfront. You gotta be sure they know where you are and what you're doing and why you're doing it. And they appreciate it. Uh, and so that's something I, I think that uh, more people in, in elected office need to do and, and use that, that method of of dealing with people. You mentioned that um, when you came into the world, you were called Daniel because, um, you know, your role would be in the lion's den. Yeah. Do you feel that has come to pass? Yes, I, I feel definitely that uh, the story about Daniel, of course, he was cast into the lion's den, and, and the reason for that was for the lions to, to devour him, which they didn't. And he lived through that and was, became a leader after that. And I think, you know, the, the spiritual background and all of that, you know, helps you to survive. But the difference is, you don't want to leave the lion's den. Well, uh, I hope someday we can calm the lion's den and uh, make it more productive. But uh, that remains to be seen. This fascinates me because it seems as though the thing to do when one has been very successful on Capitol Hill is not to aspire to a wonderful retirement and take it easy. It's essentially to work as long as you're capable of working and even die in office. I mean, is that what you foresee? Well, I foresee working as long as I can. You know, and uh, being in that position I'm in now, you know, it's a great way of helping our country and the rest of the world. Have you and Millie talked about that? Does she want to take it easy at all? Or is she completely happy with, this is how I, it is for I us? I wouldn't say she's completely happy, but she, uh, she lives with it, and uh, she, uh, we... But you've told her, this is, this is me, I, yes, I would like yes. to continue but on Capitol Hill. But she supported me, supported me very well, and, and that helps me in what I do. Yeah. So I'm so fortunate, uh, 
you know, feel been blessed with Millie and my family. And uh, what a high achieving person, what a high achieving life you've had. Yes, and when I look back at my life, there was a reason for all of this since I was born. And as Daniel, I'm still serving. So you thought, you think that you were, it was preordained, it was foreseen that you had this role in your life and it was up to you to make it happen? I feel that way, yes. Yeah, so uh, <clears throat> when I think back, you know, and when I was, I came to, to this earth, uh, I was destined, I guess, but I didn't know it. And I'm still on my way. Still on your way. Yeah. An unknown author once wrote this, it's nice to be important, but it's more important to be nice. The Hawaiian style of communicating, as Senator Akaka puts it, will be conducted on Capitol Hill for as long as he's able to serve. Mahalo to Dan Akaka and to you for joining me this week. I'm Leslie Wilcox with PBS Hawaii. Ahui ho kako. Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox is produced in HD by PBS Hawaii with Sony Technology. High definition, it's in Sony's DNA. The people of Hawaii tend to work together so much better than other places. And as a result, they're able to be more productive. They're, they're able to do more things and, and uh, uh, are, are able to do it in such a way where people enjoy it uh, and not take it as a lo somebody losing something. And I feel that that style is really needed in, in, in the capital and in the country. That, and I think the diversity of Hawaii, the diversity of people, has helped to bring that about. But Hawaii is Hawaii because of its culture, its people, its diversity, and we need to keep that.